On June 26, the destroyer leader Tashkent was at the Novorossiysk naval base and was preparing to leave for Sevastopol. It was his fifth campaign in June 1942. On June 25, Tashkent delivered more than 1,000 wounded to Novorossiysk from Sevastopol. The commander of the leader captain 3rd rank Vasily Nikolaevich Eroshenko and the commissar of the ship battalion Commissar Grigory Andreevich Konovalov immediately received the order to take on board the Siberians. 994 soldiers of the 142nd Rifle Brigade, 476mm guns with fronts, 760 rifles, ammunition, food and medicines. All this was to be delivered to Kameshevaya Bay and there again to receive the wounded, women and children and return to Novorossis. Immediately after returning from Sevastopol, the leader's team began to receive fuel and ammunition again. Red Fleet officers and petty officers of the Electromechanical Combat Unit inspected and repaired mechanisms, which in the days of the last campaigns worked with excessive load. Chief of Staff of the Black Sea Fleet Rear Admiral Ivan Dmitrievich Elisiev familiarized the commander and the commissar of the ship with the latest reports of the command of the Sevastopol defensive area, explaining that every hour the situation in the main naval base is becoming more difficult. Black Sea Fleet Commander Vice Admiral FSO Otiabuski temporarily cancelled the exit from Sevastopol and the stay of our patrol and torpedo boats in the area of the fairways during the approach to Sevastopol ships coming from the Caucasus. This was due to the fact that at the fairways of Sevastopol began to appear torpedo boats of the enemy. In the operational summary of the Black Sea Fleet headquarters for June 25 said, June 24, at Tashkent at the transition to Sevastopol at the passage of the fairway, number three of the main base attacked by four torpedo boats. Two torpedoes passed 15 to 20 meters along the bow. By artillery fire, Tashkent destroyed one enemy. It was decided to open fire on all unidentified boats detected at night, no matter what cause signs they gave. The leader realized how difficult the passage to Kamishivaya Bay would be. They realized that they would have to break the blockade. They also knew that some ships with replenishment and ammunition did not reach Sevastopol, but they also knew that the defenders of besieged Sevastopol, who were exhausted by continuous battles, were waiting for them. The commissar of the leader Grigory Andreevich reported that day that, having learned about the upcoming campaign, many Red Fleet men and petty officers applied for admission to the party. He showed me several sheets on which only one phrase was written. I asked the primary party organization of the leader of Tashkent to consider me a communist. We could not consider the applications received during the previous two campaigns, Konvalov explained. But we consider all those who applied then to be communists. He looked at me. That's right, I replied. When you come back, you'll formalize it. The loading of ammunition and food went quickly and smoothly. The Bozun Sergei Taranenko was hurrying up as we had to take Siberians with their considerable armament. Having learned that the leader Tashkent was the fastest ship in the fleet and that it was going to Kamishevaya Bay for the third time, the Siberians rejoiced. He will take us to Sevastopol, said the Siberian fighters who realized that their arrival in the besieged main base would to some extent alleviate the situation of its defenders. Siberians were convinced that the sailors would break the enemy blockade from the sea and deliver replenishment to Sevastopol. In the eyes of these people, who amazed us with their endurance and calmness, there was no fear or doubt, although they knew that they would face severe trials at the crossing. The landing began. Sailors carefully received their comrades in arms, placed them in cabins and on the deck. Siberians together with the ship's Red Fleet men deftly rolled in the guns from the pier, before they had time to get used to it properly. The fighters began to install machine guns and anti-tank guns on the bow and sides of the leader on the instructions of the ship's specialists to bring ammunition to them in order to help the crew to repel the enemy's attacks at the right moment. The commander of BC-2, Artillery Combat Unit, Senior Lieutenant N. S. Novik, was the main advisor to the Siberians, pointed out to them convenient places for placing ammunition, guns and machine guns. An unforeseen thing happened that day. One unit of Siberians was not included in the replenishment for Sevastopol, but their eagerness to get into the besieged city was so great that they, with the help of their comrades, passed to the Tashkent and were very pleased with their cunning. Yeroshenko, who learned of this, ordered all the hares to get off the ship. Not immediately the fighters left the ship. 
the commander of the unit and the political officer long begged Yeroshenko to change the decision. They appealed to me as well, but it was impossible to allow them to stay on the ship. It was necessary to load as much ammunition and food as possible, to take additionally just delivered from Krasnodar ten tons of concentrates. After all, in the days of the third assault in Sevastopol was bad with food. A part of stocks burned at the very beginning of Hitler's offensive. A part was piled up in cellars of houses destroyed by aviation and artillery shelling. There was nowhere to cook food and bake bread. Soldiers did not receive hot food for weeks. They were given canned food and breadcrumbs. From the first days of the third offensive, the inhabitants of the city were given 200 grams of flour and a glass of water a day. A day or three before this campaign, a member of the State Defense Committee, A.I. Mikoyan, asked the military council of the fleet how the fleet, the army, and the population of Sevastopol, and what food they most need. He recommended to import to Sevastopol only concentrates, canned meat, smoked sausage, lard, sugar, dry egg powder, chocolate, and vitamins, something that did not require special preparation. Finally, the loading and boarding of the Tashkent is finished. The gangways were removed. On the leader's running bridge next to the signalman fixing the halyard, the writer Evgeny Petrov. His army uniform and pilot's cap stood out noticeably against the usual ship's background of the bridge. Two days ago, Evgeny Petrov arrived in Novorossiysk and asked permission to go to Sevastopol on one of the warships. He had to prepare an essay on the Sevastopolers for the newspaper Red Star. On the Tashkent in this campaign were also cameraman Alexander Smolka and photo correspondent Alexei Mishuev. They managed to film some moments of the last campaign of the Tashkent. In July 1942, the main political department of the Navy made a photo newspaper out of Mishuev's pictures. You will be given an opportunity to get to Sevastopol, or rather to one of the bays nearest to it, but no one can vouch for your safe return to Novorossiysk. I warned Petrov. At first he took these words as a joke, but then he asked me again. Is it really so difficult to return? Yes, very difficult. Well, regardless of whether there will be a guarantee of return or not, I'm going. For the sake of credibility, the writer must see for himself everything he wants to tell about. On the evening of June 25, I informed Petrov that the leader Tashkent is being prepared for the campaign, on which he will be able to get to the besieged Sevastopol. You will be able to see how the commander and crew of the ship behave in the conditions of breaking the blockade. I recently went on the Tashkent myself, and I know how they repelled enemy aircraft attacks. Watch Lieutenant Gimmelman, commander of the anti-aircraft battery. I advised Evgeny Petrovich. He is a young commander, only before the war graduated from the Black Sea Naval School, but has amazing stamina. For an artilleryman, endurance is what often ensures success. In the last campaign, automatons of Gimmelman's battery shot down three junkers. They fell near Tashkent. In addition to these three, several planes got away, leaving a plume of smoke behind them. The anti-aircraft gunners did not allow any airplane to drop bombs. Evgeny Petrovich asked me in detail about the history of the ship, about the people who served on it. I told him everything I knew about the remarkable crew since the defense of Odessa. The writer thanked me for the story about the sailors of Tashkent. Now I have some idea about the leader's military affairs. I consider myself an old Black Sea sailor, he continued. In the 33rd year, I was a participant of the campaign in Italy and Greece. Then, if my memory serves me correctly, the cruiser Red Caucasus, destroyers Petrovsky and Xiaomian were in the squadron. I was friends with the sailors. I never forget that. You'll be friends with the sailors of the Tashkent, too. And I shook his hand firmly in farewell. On the day of Tashkent departure, the weather was usual June weather. The sea was calm, cloudless blue sky, excellent visibility and from the commanders of the ships that went to Sevastopol at that time, you could often hear complaining about such weather. Clear, cloudless days were in the hands of the enemy and first of all his aviation. Our fighter aviation was based on airfields in the Caucasus and could not cover the ships at a great distance from the bases, and for a short summer night will not pass from the Caucasus coast to Sevastopol, even on such a fast ship, which was Tashkent. Pushchinsky inspected the airfield and transmitted a radiogram to Krasnodar. Release or air loaded with ammunition airplanes stood on the airfields in readiness. Two and a half hours from the moment of Pashinsky's departure seemed to the crews of Lytu an eternity. The pilots received their assignments and impatiently waited for the signal to take off. 
That night at the airfield they issued leaflets, as Lant obtained a letter from Pilot Bibikov. I swear, as long as my hands hold the wheel, as long as my heart beats in my chest, I will fly to my last breath with all my strength to help the citizens of Sevastopol to beat, smash, destroy the enemy. Before the first flight, the aviators wrote applications with a request to be accepted into the party. Flight mechanic Gerusenko wrote, In these days of severe trials for the motherland, I want to fly as a communist on a combat mission. The group commander and Commissar Karpenko appeared at the airfield. The pilots surrounded them, and Korotkov read Pushinsky's telegram. Airplanes one after another began to cut down on the start. Took off at intervals of 10-15 minutes, as in the Sevastopol operation was adopted tactics of single flights. This made it possible to avoid the accumulation of airplanes at the Chassanese airfield, which was under constant artillery fire. I remember how the first airplanes returned from besieged Sevastopol, whom said I, S.S. Belkin. Crew commanders excitedly and hastily reported on the fulfilment of the task. On the faces of pilots shone an expression of joy and pride. It is difficult to convey in words the condition of the wounded taken out of Sevastopol. Stunned by silence, they with pleasure inhaled a full chest of clean morning air and with tears in their eyes thanked the pilots. The crews on their own initiative took out of the airplane everything possible, including rescue equipment to make room for an extra box of ammunition and to take more wounded from Sevastopol. After the first flights revealed and shortcomings, pilots made several approaches to get permission to land, not immediately unloaded the delivered, the wounded were not everywhere brought to the place of landing and parking lie too. On behalf of the Mayon Command, the Commissar of the 3rd Squadron Senior Political Officer E.I.S. Belkin flew to the Chersonese airfield. He had to meet with a member of the Military Council of the Fleet Divisional Commissar N.M. Kulekov and report that prevents more successfully fulfilled the task. Flying Belkin on the lie too, where the commander was Senior Lieutenant Yubimov. A flight mechanic was wounded in the crew and the squadron commander did not want to release him. Then I asked Bulkin replace the flight mechanic for the duration of the flight. The night was quiet and clear. Lubimov, with great caution, landed at the Chesanese airfield. As soon as the engines stopped, the continuous cannonade, bursting shells on the airfield became clearly audible. Soon there was a meeting with Kulikov. It turned out that Nikolai Mikhailovich had already taken measures that airplanes immediately after landing unloaded and took the maximum number of wounded. When I, S. Belkin, returned to the airfield, the plane loaded 37 wounded. Lai 2 was clearly overloaded, but Lyubimov proved that all the wounded and crew members weigh no more than 80 kilograms, and after making a calculation, he took on board two more people. Captain Molotsov, sent from the Maui, was at the Chersonese airfield to receive and dispatch Lai 2 airplanes. He, together with the 20th Air Base, managed to organize the work so that for ten nights of continuous flights only one Lai-2 suffered an accident on landing, although landing almost every Lai-2 received some damage, as the airfield was strewn with shrapnel and dug craters. Upon landing the airplane was immediately brought into the Kapania, where further unloading and landing of wounded was carried out. At this time they made urgent repairs, eliminated breakdowns that could prevent takeoff. The entire flight crew of the squadron worked very hard. The enemy knew that night flights were taking place at the Chersonese airfield and every day increased the artillery bombardment of the airfield. In the archives of the main directorate of the civil air fleet, there are reports of those days about flights to besieged Sevastopol. I bring one of the reports in full so that the reader has an idea of the conditions under which the Moscow Special Purpose Aviation Group worked. To a member of the Military Council of the North Caucasus Front, Admiral Isakov to the commander of the 5th Air Army, Major General of Aviation Goryunov. Operational report on the performance of the task of cargo transportation on the night of June 26, 2019-42. Task. The aviation group entrusted to me was assigned the task to continue transportation of ammunition with landing at the airfield Chersonese Lighthouse. Executed. Fifteen airplane sorties were made. All tasks completed transported to Sevastopol 28 380 kg of ammunition, transported 336 wounded. From Sevastopol to Krasnodar delivered 2,000 TG of special cargo. At the moment of arrival of our airplanes and during their stay at the airfield, the latter was shelled by intensive fire of the enemy's field artillery. 
during an hour and a half stay of our planes on the airfield was dropped more than a hundred shells. At the same time, the airfield was subjected to fierce bombing from the air. All our planes returned safely to their bases. The commander of the Mayon, Major Korotkov. Mayon Commissar Senior Battalion, Commissar Karpenko. On the night of June 29, 11 transport planes landed at the Kursanese airfield, which delivered 18 tons of ammunition and food at a repair crew headed by A.P. Soloviev. On the night of June 29, one of the Li 2s landed in a crater, broke the landing gear, and bent the propeller. They could not eliminate the breakage at the airfield. Actually, Soloviev's brigade put everything in order except the propeller. The propeller was to be delivered on July 1, but on that day the Li 2 stopped flying and on July 2, Solovyov, based on the situation, burned the plane. The repair crew was taken prisoner. Solovyev and his comrades went through a difficult way of camps, but all of them remained faithful sons of the motherland. The commissar of the 1st Squadron, Ayas Bulkin, flew three times these days to the Shersonese airfield. He even now cannot calmly talk about the dedication of aviators who flew to the besieged Sevastopol. With admiration, he tells about the courage and skill of fighter pilots of the Black Sea Fleet, covering the Li-2 and storming the enemy and its fire points. For ten days, the Moscow Air Group of Special Purpose made 229 night combat sorties, transported more than 200 tons of ammunition and food to the besieged, took out 1542 wounded, 630 people of the flight crew, and 12 tons of special cargo. At the end of June, on the northern side in the area of Konstantinovsky Ravelin, Hitlerites installed a searchlight. As soon as it began to darken, it probed the sky, illuminated the southern coast. On June 29th, fighter pilot hero of the Soviet Union Mikhail, Avdiv was returning from a combat mission at dusk. Flying to the airfield, he noticed a flashed searchlight. The beam came from the area of Konstantinovsky Ravelin. Avdiv knew that with the onset of darkness will arrive Lai too. Going up in the air during the day, he saw how the wounded were brought to the Kapaniers. The enemy searchlight would prevent the landing of the Li-2 the day before because of the searchlights, several planes could not land on the airfield and had to drop their cargo on parachutes. Mikhail Vasilyevich decided to extinguish the searchlight. Aviv twice came in on the beam and dive-bombed it. Confident that the searchlight was finished, he returned to land, but the beam flashed again and began to grope the airfield. I was very angry that I was not able to extinguish the searchlight, recalls Adiev, and decided to finish him at all costs. Fuel ammunition were running low, but Avdiev could not afford to land on the airfield without eliminating the traitorous beam. Avdiev went to the Ravelin on a glide. Now the pilot came in from the land. The enemy led an intense anti-aircraft fire, shells Hitlerites did not have to save. Machine guns also opened fire. The pilot felt the impact, but continued to fly to the target. And the searchlight went out. Avdiev shot him, almost at point-blank range. The landing gear did not work, as it was damaged by enemy anti-aircraft guns. It was the last combat flight of Avdivian besieged Sevastopol. That night, Mikhail Vasilyevich repeatedly came out of the shelter and looked in the direction of the Ravelin. The searchlight did not shine. In the afternoon of June 26, I flew to the 2nd Mine Torpedo Regiment, to which I was to present the Guard's banner. By order of the People's Commissar of the Navy, the regiment was transformed into the 5th Guards Aviation Regiment for the bravery, fortitude, courage, discipline and organisation shown in the battles for the heroism of the personnel. I had been to this regiment many times before. For the first time it happened on the second day of the war, when 27 bombers bombed Constanta and returned without losses. The regiment Commander Anate Tokarev was awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union for his participation in the Finnish campaign. Outwardly, it was a stocky, medium-sized man, in which at first sight felt a great physical strength, firmness of character, will, the look of dark eyes fast, as if probing. Nikolai Alexandrovich flew often and had a rich combat experience, was an unquestionable authority for his subordinates. In the regiment I had to hear such a dip to the raid victorious, combat, to daring flights, drives to Kerev hero, our airplanes. I will allow myself to quote an excerpt from the report on the combat operations of the 63rd Aviation Brigade, which included the 2nd Mine Torpedo Regiment, 
so that the reader could judge the flights of this remarkable pilot. On this day, Tokarev, according to intelligence data, twice drove his pilots to bombard the accumulation of enemy manpower and military equipment. On the second sortie, our bombers were attacked by four Mi-109s. As a result, Tokari's plane was hit. The cantilever gas tank of the right plane punctured. It began to burn. Tokarev did not leave until the bombs were dropped on the target. Having completed the task, Tokarev decided to make a landing at Cape Hoko. Approaching the airfield, the colonel found out that the airplane had a damaged landing gear release system. The lock did not work. Only thanks to Tokarev's great flying skill and his desire to save not only the crew, but also the airplane, the landing was made safely. The airplane has now been put into service. Comparatively recently, I received a letter from Nikolarev, the former commissar of the 18th Air Regiment, retired Colonel A.S. Miroshnyshenko, reminded me that Mikhail Talayev's plane, left on the neutral strip, had flown over the fascist positions. The plane was saved in the following way. From the side of the Marine Trenches, Il-2 was clearly visible. The commander of the 18th Assault Regiment A, a. Gubria gave engineer Captain P. S. Vuravlev the task to save the plane. Commander of the sector, Colonel A. Kapitakin, allocated two sappers. They did their job, cut the wire, cleared the way. Having studied the place where Il-2 stood, engineers Zhuravlev and mechanics Baikov and Krivoy came out of hiding at night and pulled the cable behind them. Taking great precaution, Zhuravlev, Baikov and Krivoy secured the rope to the aircraft and returned to the shelter. After midnight, they began towing. The tractor roared, the cable stretched like a string, and then the enemy became alarmed. Rockets flew up, shooting started, but the airplane was safely towed to our territory. Ten days later, the repaired Il-2 returned to service. The work of the engineering staff in that period was a feat. In air battles, especially when attacking the enemy, airplanes were often damaged. I had to see Il-2s shot down and mangled, I admit that I could not believe that they could be restored. But engineers and technicians at night, under enemy fire, continuously patched the holes, repaired engines and equipment, and the planes were in good condition for combat sorties. The technical staff showed special efficiency in repairing airplanes during the June days. On June 16, one of the attack aircraft returned with punctured tyres and could not reach the Caponia. The enemy did not stop shelling the airfield. However, Senior Technician Lieutenant Ivan Grigorievich Nesterenko delivered the wheels to the plane and replaced them within 15 minutes under artillery fire. The Isle II came to life and rolled into cover. On June 18, another pilot returned with a punctured gas tank and also did not reach the shelter. The technicians did not wait and under artillery fire and bombing hurried to the plane. While the gas tank was being repaired, a shell exploded near the plane. Three men were wounded by shrapnel. Having hastily made bandages, they continued their work. The gas tank was removed, a new one was put on, and only when the ill two taxied to the Caponier, the wounded went to the sanitary unit. They were Samoylenko, Mikhailenok, and Konovalov. During the defence of Sevastopol, in the regiment operated a special repair group. The initiator and the soul of it was a communist engineer captain, Pyotr Semyonyevich Shuravlev. The group consisted of Mechanic Spikov, Krivoy, Shulga, Malyshev, Skabinsky, Motorist Semishav, and others. This group restored those airplanes that could not be repaired by technicians who provided combat sorties. It should be noted that it was Zuravlev's group that again lifted into the sky mangled, hopelessly broken airplanes, including Il-2 of Mikhail Talalayev's squadron commander. The golden hands of selfless enthusiasts did wonders, and it is a pity writes one of the veterans Mirai Triakin, that the names of these inconspicuous toilers of the war are forgotten. June 26, trip to Sevastopol, was the last not only for the Tashkent, but for all large surface ships, including destroyers. It was no longer possible to send destroyers without reliable air cover. That's why they cancelled the voyage of Subrazitelny, which arrived from Poti with ammunition for the 35th Battery. The destroyer only removed the wounded and evacuated from the leader Tashkent. The situation with the delivery of goods to the besieged Sevastopol and the removal of the wounded became more complicated. Now only submarines, minesweepers, boats and transport aviation continued to feed Sevastopol and remove people. In these days, Admiral I.S. Isakov, a member of the Military Council of the North Caucasus Front, 
reported to the Military Council of the Black Sea Fleet that the Supreme Command allocated to strengthen the food supply Sevastopol Moscow Air Group of Special Purpose of the Civil Air Fleet of 20 Transport Aircraft Lee 2. Admiral Isakov asked the fleet command how to deliver the cargo, parachute or landing method, at what time of day to arrive in Sevastopol, at what points to send the planes. The fleet command asked to deliver cargoes to the Chersonese airfield to take the wounded on the return flight. Lie 2 should arrive with the onset of darkness and fly away immediately after unloading and receiving the wounded. The responsibility for the timely preparation and delivery of cargo for the besieged city was entrusted to the head of the rear of the Air Force of the Black Sea Fleet, Colonel M. D. Zelenov. I cannot but say a kind word to Matvey Danilovich Zelenov, now a retired Lieutenant General. During the war years, all the tasks of the Military Council of the Fleet were fulfilled by him on time, and Matvey Danilovich coped with this important task perfectly. There was not a single claim to him for the preparation for the shipment of cargo to the main naval base. And in Sevastopol in these June days was the commander of the air forces of the Black Sea Fleet Major General, Vasily Vasily Vishemashenko. He allocated a group of commanders from the 20th Air Base to receive and dispatch transport planes from the Chersonese airfield. The commissar of the 3rd Squadron of the Moscow Special Purpose Air Group senior political officer E.S. Bulkin told me about how persistently the pilots and technicians, having learned that the upcoming flights to Sevastopol, asked the squadron commander V.P. Pushchinsky to include them in the group. The crews of the two squadrons of the special air group included the best pilots who had combat experience, showed courage and fortitude during flights to Dago Island, deep behind enemy lines to besieged Leningrad. The commanders of the crews of airships were remarkable pilots shoot off, Neronov, Polosukin, Smirnov, Vokov, Nishke, Kartalov, Shashin, Ponomarenko, Petrov, Goshtein, Grishevsky, Shevyakov, Ilchenko, Koshevoy, Skrilnikov, Lyubimov, Bybikov, Rusakov, and Kolesnikov. Many of them are no longer alive, but in our memory they are eternally alive. On June 20, 1942, the Moscow Air Group of Special Purpose, Mayon E., consisting of 20 Lie 2 transport planes under the command of Major Korotkov, flew from Venukov to Krasnoda. A member of the Military Council of the North Caucasus, Front Admiral I.S. Isakov, and the commander of the 5th Air Army Major General of Aviation S.K. Gorinov explained to the commander of the Mayon Major V.M. Korotkov and Commissar Senior Battalion Commissar in Karpenko the situation in besieged Sevastopol. Our artillery and mortars, because of the lack of ammunition more silent in those days, had only occasionally fired direct fire at the attacking infantry and enemy tanks. Every shell and mine was on the account of the besieged. In Sevastopol accumulated a lot of wounded. The task of the aviation group was to deliver ammunition, food and medicines to transport the wounded. The headquarters of the air group developed routes and a plan for the air operation. For a covert approach to the Chersonese Cape, chose a mountainous strip of the Caucasian coast between Anapa and Novorossiysk. At the traverse of Sudak route changed and passed along the coast, but at a considerable distance from it, to hide the noise of engines from enemy sound catchers and make the route inaccessible to German anti-aircraft batteries. In Krasnoda, the first squadron was relocated to one of the nearby airfields to disperse the group. Despite the remoteness from the command of the group, the squadron successfully coped with the task assigned to it. This was greatly facilitated by the experience of the squadron commander, the oldest pilot, Lieutenant Colonel Konstantin Alexandrovich Bukharov. Bukharov served in aviation since 1922. For several years, he was an instructor at the Kachin Aviation School. This experience allowed Bukharov to perfectly prepare his crews to fulfill a difficult task. And now, 30 years later, Konstantin Alexandrovich recalls with great warmth his comrades in arms, combat comrades who courageously performed extremely difficult tasks. He told how navigators used searchlights to determine the course, which served as beacons for them. There were three of them. The first searchlight rotated in a circle, and its beam fell to the horizon in the direction of the west, in the direction of Sevastopol. The second one raised the beam to the zenith and sharply lowered it towards the west. The third illuminated the western direction fanwise. When the flight plan was developed, squadron commanders Pushinsky and Bukharov with Commissars Bulkin and Kuznetsov held a meeting. Pilots talked about the readiness to fulfill the task, 
No matter how difficult the circumstances, Cruz welcomed the proposal of the group commander, Major Korotkov, to make two sorties per night. Pilots, Yubimov and Skrinikov, were among the first who managed to make two flights with landing during the night. The first to lay the night route to the besieged Sevastopol flew the commander of the 3rd Squadron Captain Vladimir Alexandrovich Pushchinsky. Heavily loaded Li-2 approached the start, turned on the headlights and in the night gloom illuminated the runway. Twenty-five years later I met with the brave communist pilot and learned that Pushinsky had never flown to Sevastopol before, as well as the co-pilot VPI Kolsnikov. Recollecting this flight, Vladimir Alexandrovich spoke about the difficulties of flying the Li-2 over the sea. Great endurance, courage and, of course, flying skill were required. On moonlit nights, the shadows of clouds created a deceptive impression of a mountainous coastal chain on the water surface, which often misled even an experienced pilot. In a kind word, Pushinsky recalls the naval navigators who flew in the crews of the Li-2. They were perfectly oriented in flight over the sea. Vladimir Alexandrovich still remembers his first flight. He flew the plane over the sea, set a course for Sevastopol. Having passed Fedosha, he saw burning forests. Then the horizon was illuminated by an alarming red light. Having flown a little more, the pilot saw reflections of fire in the bays. It seemed as if the water itself was burning. It was Sevastopol. At the outermost ledge, washed on three sides by the sea, several times blinked red and green lights Chesanese lighthouse, the conditional signal to land. On the ground, a triangle of lanterns lit up. Vladimir Alexandrovich landed, approached the Kapanir. The airfield was bombarded by artillery fire. After the first planes were shot down, the aptly named Don't Touch Me became firmly established behind the floating battery. It became obvious that the enemy planes were trying in every possible way to bypass the battery area. In November, the battery was put in Cossack Bay to cover the Chersonese airfield. Enemy pilots called the area of the floating battery square of death here is what record was found in the book of the shot down Nazi pilot. Yesterday, my friend Max did not return from a square of death. Before that, Willie, Paul and others did not return from there. We lost ten airplanes in this square. To fly there means to die. The fleet command highly appreciated the combat activity of the floating battery, no. Three, many of the personnel were awarded battle orders and medals and it is not difficult to imagine how dear to the neighbourhood Don't Touch Me flight technical staff of the Chersonese airfield. Lieutenant General Hero of the Soviet Union N.I. Normov, who was at the Chersonese airfield until the last day, recalls. The accurate fire of the floating battery discouraged Hitler's pilots from approaching the airfield at low altitude. But in June came hard days for anti-aircraft gunners. Hitler's aviation bombed and stormed the floating islet, all the time kept it under artillery and mortar fire. Fortitude and selflessness were the norm of behaviour of all crew members. But the battery suffered irrecoverable losses every day. The wounded, as a rule, did not leave their combat post as long as they could hold on. The commander of the machine gun, petty officer of the second article Kozenko, was wounded, but continued to fire and shot down an enemy airplane. After the second wound, the hero's heart stopped. By June 26, 1942, less than half of the active barrels and personnel remained at Battery No. Three, but don't touch me, continued to fire. Severely wounded, among them was the Commissar N. S. Sarida, was sent to Kamishabaya. On June 27, the survivors said goodbye to the mortally wounded Commander Lieutenant Commander Sergei Yakovlevich Mashensky. Veterans still remember the last words of the commander. Farewell, friends but know that I die with the knowledge that you will stand in battle. In the afternoon, a large group of enemy bombers struck again. Two direct hits of large bombs finally destroyed the floating battery. Many heroes were killed. The survivors went ashore and continued to fight at the Chersonese airfield and at the 35th battery. Twenty-six round enemy planes were on the account of the floating battery, no. Three, their number included only those that fell in the field of vision but a lot of Hitler's vultures left with an ominous plume of smoke. Many of them probably did not reach their airfields. With the loss of the floating battery, the defence of the Chersonese airfield was significantly weakened. But reconstruction work was still going on at the airfield. One day the airfield was subjected to particularly intense bombing and artillery fire. 
At that time, Sailor Padolka was rolling up the craters from bombs and shells covered with earth on the airfield. It happened that during the bombs' raid, the sailor could not take cover, as he was in the middle of the airfield. Padolka jumped off the tractor and jumped into the hollow part of the roller. When the raid was over, the sailor was barely pulled out of his hiding place. The thing is that the tractor was mangled by the direct hit of the bomb, and the roller, which was attached to the tractor, was thrown far aside. Despite the rather large abrasions and bruises, Padalka continued to roll the funnels, having adapted another tractor for this purpose. Major General Vivi Amachenkov, commander of the Black Sea Fleet Air Force, awarded Padalka the Order of the Red Star the next day. About the difficult situation at the front edge of the Sevastopol defensive area, which required maximum aviation support, told me back in those days the inspector of the Black Sea Fleet Air Force, Na Naumov, now he is also one of the deputy commanders of the Navy Aviation. It should be said that Nikolai Alexandrovich belongs to the cohort of the bravest fighter pilots. During the war years, he quickly mastered new types of fighters coming to the fleet. He himself retrained 200 fighter pilots, tirelessly trained pilots in aerial combat. Namov accounted for hundreds of combat sorties, 17 enemy planes shot down, 11 of them fighters. I saw how in one air battle near Novorossiysk in April 1942 Nikolai Alexandrovich shot down a bomber. Admiral M.G. Kuznetsov, People's Commissar of the Navy, who observed the air battle when he learned that the bomber was shot down by Colonel Normov, an inspector of the Air Force, awarded him a personalised gold watch. In the June days of 1942, had to carry out a whole operation to take off the winged machines. At first, the traces of bombing and shelling were covered, new runways were marked, then aisle two with released brake shields, raising a cloud of red Chersonese dust behind it, and slowly taxied along the airfield. Towards him, from the other end of the airfield, another L2 was taxiing just as slowly, and between them there was a semi-truck, behind which a log was dragging along the airfield. In the back of the car were cylinders with compressed air, and lowered to the ground rubber hoses raised clouds of dust. The whole airfield was covered in dust. From the air, it seems that the airfield is preparing to take off a lot of airplanes. Messerschmitt's call for reinforcements and to Cape Chersonese from all the nearest Hitler airfields fly German fighters. In half an hour, they are already several dozen, but passes 20, 40 minutes an hour, and no one takes off from the airfield. Messerschmitt's, having used up fuel, fly away. After a few minutes from different sides of the airfield fly out our fighters, led by Captain Mikhail Avdiv. A part of them restrains the remaining Mi-109s, and the rest cover the Isle twos flying out to attack the enemy, led by the illustrious commander, hero of the Soviet Union A, A. Gubriya. The front line is very close, 5-10 kilometers from the airfield. Soon attack aircrafts and fighters return and become in Caponias. By this time, the number of German fighters increases considerably, but our planes are no longer in the air, and there is no reason for enemy fighters to storm the airfield. They know that the Soviet planes are reliably protected in the shelters. And the airfield again begins hard work. Everyone is preparing for night action. The main sorties attack aircraft make in the evening and morning twilight when the enemy fighters annoy less. To guard the ships, give them the opportunity to unload ammunition and take the wounded. Fighters should also cover transport planes, which also deliver ammunition and food and take away the wounded. In the days of the heroic defence of Sevastopol, I often had to meet with pilots whose names were spoken with love and admiration by the defenders of Sevastopol. Appearance of attack aircraft over the front line of defence always caused a combat lift and loud joy of our infantrymen. Not once after the air attack, the infantry pressed the enemy, and there were times when Hitlerites under the powerful fire barrage of attacking aircraft fled in panic, leaving their positions and weapons. The image of fearless communist pilot Captain Fedor Nikolaevich to Genève remained in my memory. I had an opportunity to present him with combat awards. Fyodor Nikolaevich, in June 1942, several times a day, took his pilots to assault the advancing enemy, to suppress his fire points. On one of those days, five Isle twos, led by Turgenev, made a daring raid on the enemy airfield, where eleven twin-engine airplanes were destroyed, all L2s returned to the airfield, but each had several holes. When the 18th Attack Regiment was ordered to relocate to the Caucasus on June 30, 
Captain I.M.I.F. Turgenev was the last to fly out of the Kapanir. In the fuselage of his Il-2, he placed a technician and a mechanic who provided him with combat sort. Fyodor Nikolaevich was already approaching the flying field when he noticed the squadron engineer Vasily Znamensky. Turgenev stopped the plane and offered Znamensky to be his third passenger, and it should be said to uninitiated readers that Il-2 is not adapted for passenger transportation at all, but Vasily Znamensky gratefully accepted Fyodor Nikolaevich's offer, as he probably knew that Captain Turgenev, in spite of such an overload, would be able to take off and fly to the Caucasian airfield. It's hard to believe, but it was so. With three passengers, Fyodor Nikolaevich lifted Il-2 and flew safely to Anapa. Set aircrafts under the command of FN Turgenev took an active part in the offensive operation. More than 200 combat sorties were made personally by FN Turgenev, 86 of them during the defense of Sevastopol, with his courage and bravery. He served as an example for his subordinates and was awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. The feat of brave pilot Senior Lieutenant Evgeny Ivanovich Lobanov will never be forgotten. Zhenya Lobanov loved to fly very much, and he flew brilliantly. High technique of piloting, extraordinary courage caused admiration of comrades. From the first days of the defense of Sevastopol Lobanov in the battles, his assaults are always very effective. He did not like to shoot at will. Every cartridge, every shell he directed only at the right and close target. He had an exceptional ability to find the enemy no matter how well he disguised himself. More than once Lobanov fearlessly continued the attack when around the plane burst shells and shrapnel hit the planes. But the 89th flight of Evgeny Lobanov to attack the enemy was the last. A group of attack aircraft under the command of the wing commander Captain Mikhail Talalayev successfully stormed enemy positions in the Belbek area. Despite the heavy Hitlerite fire, the pilots made several approaches and began to return to their airfield. On the way back, the fascists shot down the leading Il-2. The engine stalled and Talalayev was forced to land on a neutral strip closer to the enemy trenches. Leaving the hit machine, the commander began to make his way to his own, but when he was crawling to the trenches, he was wounded. Hitlerites saw that the pilot was wounded, but alive and still leaving, and began to surround him, trying to capture him. Then Evgeny Lobanov descended to the height of shaving flight and began to cover the departure of the commander with machine gun fire, despite the fact that the enemy's fire was concentrated on his ill too. Lobanov made one more approach, destroyed part of the Hitlerites approaching the commander, and forced the rest to lie down. This gave Talalayev an opportunity to reach the marine trenches, but Lobanov's plane was hit and caught fire in the air. Thus, saving the commander died a fearless pilot, communist Evgeny Ivanovich Lobanov. Posthumously, he was awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. The memory of Evgeny Lobanov lives in the hearts of people. One of the streets of Sevastopol bears his name. Not far from Dachankoy, there is a village Lobanovka, Motorship Hero A. Lobanov sails the waters of the Kama Reservoir. Bolshaya Kashirskaya Street in the proletarian district of Moscow was renamed to the street named after hero of the Soviet Union Evgeny Lobanov. In July 1970, I was invited to the celebration of the street named after hero of the Soviet Union E.I. Lobanov. The houses stood in festive attire. From a large portrait on the facade of the building on me looked brave black sea pilot Evgeny Ivanovich Lobanov, that's how he remained in my memory, and as if meetings in besieged Sevastopol with Sturmoviks of the 18th Air Regiment, where Lobanov was a bright example of military valor, came to life. At the rally dedicated to the memory of the hero, relatives, friends, and comrades who knew Zinya Lobanov as far back as in few, and the construction of the first stage of the Moscow Metro spoke. The present hero of the Soviet Union, Major General of Aviation Mikhail Avidi also spoke. Mikhail Vesalevich repeatedly covered Lobanov in the Sevastopol sky at the time when Zenya stormed the front line and firing positions of the enemy. Hmm. Keep it up. Yes, keep it up. Sergei Stepanovich had done very rightly, having provided a part of the ship's speed in reserve. As soon as the enemy's batteries fired, the ship gave full speed. The salvos lay Aston. The destroyer skipped the zone of fire. The shelling stopped. The tension eased. It became so happy that I could not stand it, and somewhat excitedly said to Volkov and Kovshmi, Yes, indeed, all of you here are lucky. And no wonder. 
brilliant combat training, well-mannered and trained personnel, hence the luck. The destroyer Sabrazitelny traveled 60,000 miles during the war without average repairs. 200 times it went out on combat missions, shelled the coast occupied by the enemy, landed troops, convoyed transports that carried tens of thousands of soldiers and thousands of tons of military cargo. More than 13,000 wounded and evacuated people were taken out of besieged Odessa and Sevastopol. Sabrazitelny repelled more than a hundred attacks of enemy aircraft, shot down five enemy planes. The ship itself did not receive a single hit of bombs, torpedoes and shells. The personnel of the destroyer did not have any killed and wounded during the whole war. Combat merits of the destroyer Subrazitelny crowned with glory. He was awarded the title of guards. In difficult conditions made combat flights 3rd Special Aviation Group of the Sevastopol Defensive Area, Bezirova Nuvayusha Shire, at the Shersonese Airfield. The situation became especially difficult in the second half of June 1942. From about the 20th, the enemy was monitoring the airfield not only from the air, but also from the north side. The slightest movement on the airfield caused an immediate reaction of Hitlerites. Dust from a passing car, tractor or running airplane engine immediately served as a signal for the beginning of artillery shelling of the airfield. The Chersonese airfield was the only one operating in those days. From the first to the last day of the siege of Sevastopol, its work did not stop. In the initial period of defence at the airfield and the inhabitants of Sevastopol worked selflessly. But the main burden of providing combat aviation of the Black Sea Fleet fell on the airfield engineering units of Major Engineer V.V. Kazansky and the personnel of the 20th Air Base, the commander of which was I, it's Gobkin. Personnel, not considering the difficulties and great risk, did everything that was possible. Under enemy fire, they cleared and expanded the airfield, built strong shelters for planes, the so-called Kapaneers, which were covered with a half-metre layer of steel. Only a direct hit of a bomb or a large shell could put such a Kapaneer out of action. The soldiers serving the airfield dug underground, warehouses, built reliable structures, shelters for command posts, for the flight crew, graders and rollers, levelled the airfield, brought ammunition and fuel to the planes. The commissar of the base Ilarion Terentivich Lukyanov often appeared on the airfield. He always came where it was difficult, and often included himself in any work. When the airfield learned that the commissar after the second wound in June again refused hospitalization, the attitude of subordinates to Lukyanov became even more cordial and careful. The airplanes that landed on Chersonese had to be immediately put into Kapaneers to protect the machines from shelling and bombing. Only for June 24, 1230 shells were fired on the airfield and up to 200 bombs were dropped. Bombs and shells not only put airplanes and people out of action, but spoiled the airfield so badly that pilots could not take off and land after shelling. Despite the artillery fire and Messerschmitt patrols, the airfield crews marked the runway suitable for takeoff, leveled the craters, removed numerous fragments that could damage the wheels of airplanes. Next to the airfield in a ravine sheltered from the Germans was hard work to repair the machines. There were few airplanes, and they received more damage during takeoff and landing than during the battle in the air. The main aircraft workshops in Round Bay were destroyed by German bombers as early as April 24, 1942. During this raid died a wonderful man and a talented pilot, one of the enthusiasts of airborne troops, commander of the air forces of the Black Sea Fleet, major general hero of the Soviet Union, N. A. Ostryakov, he was at that time 34 years old. Until the middle of June at the airfield were based planes bombing group P-2, led by the commander of the 5th Squadron, Captain I. Korzunov. Those two planes, which appeared over the wounded Tashkent on June 27, were from the 5th Squadron, one of them piloted by the famous pilot Korzunov. Ivan Agorovich began his combat career as a squadron commander, participated in daring raids on enemy objects located in the deep rear. For six months, day after day from the airfield at the Chesonese Lighthouse, bombers led by Korzunov, and went over the scorched, shrunk into a steel fist Sevastopol. Kozunov's maneuver was always extremely accurate, and his courage and surprise invariably brought success. While the enemy came to his senses, navigator bombardier Ivan Felatov had time to put a stock of his bombs on the target. Ivan Igorovich completed the first hundred combat sorties in the Crimea. The second hundred began in the midst of the fighting for the Caucasus. The third one was dialed in the days of our victorious offensive, 
when Hitler's scum was expelled from the Soviet land? After 286th combat, Sorti I.E. Korzunov was awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. At the final stage of the war, Korzunov commanded a division, but still continued to fly combat missions. In the post-war years, Colonel General I. Korzunov was deputy commander of the aviation of the Navy of the Soviet Union. The second airplane in that pair of Petyakovs was flown by Andrei Kuzmik Kondrashin. He passed a glorious combat path from pilot to squadron commander, participated in the defense of Odessa, Sevastopol, 296 combat sorties, made the brave pilot. On January 11, 1944, in the battles for the liberation of Odessa, A.K. Kondrashin died a brave death. He was also awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. His name is forever inscribed in the lists of the aviation squadron named after Hero of the Soviet Union A. P. Tatsumia, due to the lack of airplanes for night combat operations, began to use U-2-1B and U-2B airplanes. They were armed with two RS-82 rockets, machine guns, and had a device for hanging bombs. One of the initiators of the use of training planes was the commissar of the 3rd Special Aviation Group, Boris Evgenievich Mikhailov. Combat work of the crews of these airplanes consisted not only in preliminary air and ground reconnaissance. They destroyed the enemy's manpower, suppressed his fire points. In difficult for Sevastopol June days Utiwed and U-2B made five seven sorties per... The airplanes literally hung in the air over the enemy's front line, inflicted great damage to his manpower, destroyed fire points, exhausted the enemy physically and mentally. Not once senior lieutenants Tolstikov, Klimov Sergeant Shankarin, Pirogov and Nefidov stormed the troops on the roads of Alma and Mamashe valleys, bombed railroad trains and stations. In one of the night sorties, pilot Klimov was in the zone of enemy anti-aircraft fire points and got into the crosshairs of searchlights. Maneuvering, Klimov escaped from the rays, but the enemy shells still hit the plane. The fuselage was shattered, and the tail of the plane was held only on racks and fell off at landing. Pilot Sergeant Nefedov only in June nights, 63 times flew out to storm the enemy's front line to suppress its fire points. The regimental commissar B.A. took part in these combat flights. E. Mikhailov At the end of May 1942, in the 3rd Special Air Group of the Black Sea Fleet Air Force, was created political department. Boris Yevgenievich so skillfully organized the work of the political department that in the most difficult days of the second half of June in the air group began to publish a printed multi-circulation newspaper. The newspaper instilled faith in the inevitability of our victory over fascism, called for fortitude, told about the fearlessness and selflessness of pilots and technicians. In these June days, the party commission accepted 140 people from the air group into the ranks of the party. The enemy knew that our anti-aircraft artillery is sitting on a starvation ration, three, five shells per day per gun. Hitlerites also knew that anti-aircraft gunners in these last days of June were saving shells for German tanks, on which they hit almost without a miss. Our large caliber machine guns fired quite successfully at the enemy planes, but the Germans tried not to go down into the zone of their action. In Cossack Bay near the airfield at the Chersonese Lighthouse floating battery. No, three was located. The anti-aircraft gunners of the battery so successfully repelled the attacks of enemy pilots that the enemies could not practically prevent our planes from landing. The history of the creation of this battery is as follows. Floating compartment of the ship's hull at one time served to test the strength of the design of new ships in underwater explosions. It was also a target for attacks by torpedo boats. To build a floating battery in this compartment was suggested by Captain First Rank Grigory Alexandrovich Butakov, a representative of a famous naval dynasty, now living in Leningrad. Many generations of Butakov served in the Navy. One of them, Peter Butakov, built the galley fleet of Peter the Great and Grigory Alexandrovich's grandfather was a participant in the first defense of Sevastopol, GAA. Butakov himself, a participant in the Civil War, commanded a battery on a destroyer. The Navy Military Council accepted Butakov's proposal and instructed the Sergo Ords on a naval plant to build a floating anti-aircraft battery. A day later, recalls the director of the plant, M.N. Sergushev, when all the sketches were ready, I came to the north side again. Now the floating compartment resembled a huge disturbed beehive. 
Mountains of metal structures and mechanisms were lying. Some were as of people were working at the same time. Some were assembling the fighting deck house and the signal mast, making mountings for the rangefinder. Others were installing the foundations for the guns. The work did not stop for an hour. In order to provide light camouflage, hatches and shafts were covered at night with tarpaulins, but this made the stuffiness impossible. Design designer VLI, Ivitsky, senior builder VLA. Lozenko put all their experience into the construction of the floating battery. Brigadiers Anatoly Razlandovsky and Savily Koiga with their crews decided not to waste time on trips home and back and settled down for a short night's rest right in the compartment. In 18 days, the battery was ready. On it arrived sailors from almost all the ships of the squadron. The crew of floating battery, no. Three amounted to 150 people. Senior Lieutenant Sergei Yakovlevich Moshensky was appointed command before that he served on the battleship Paris Commune as a turret commander. Political officer Nestor Stepanovich, Sarida became the commissar of the floating battery. From the Black Sea School arrived Lieutenant Sahaya. He was appointed commander of the 76mm battery. Lieutenant Im Menipin, commander of the 37mm battery of automatic rifles. Lieutenant 3. Lopatko, commander of the two-gun 130mm battery. The battery was equipped with DSH key machine guns and searchlight. Floating battery. No. 3. Was anchored northwest of the Chersonese lighthouse. Its task was not to let the enemy aircraft to the fleet base, to disrupt the targeted bombing. To their belts were attached to the ends of the leering, so that people would not be washed overboard. All were soaked, neither Zuidvesky nor storm suits saved them. It's hard, I thought. Good thing everyone is hardened. With such brave sailors, any hardships of combat campaigns are surmountable. The weather continued to get fresher, and the wind was getting stronger. The antenna was torn off. Communication with the ground was broken. I watched with what persistence and dexterity the Red Fleet men restored the antenna. The ship shuddered after each blow of the oncoming wave. It seemed that the stem would not stand. At times the half-bank was hidden in the water, one could hear the anchor chain rattling. Cascades of cold spray reached the bridge, showered us, cut our faces like grains of sand in a strong wind. From the wave blows cracks appeared on the deck on the 36th spar. They went across the deck and down the starboard and port sides of the ship. About 300 tons of seawater entered the lower rooms. It was getting harder and harder to go. A depth bomb was ripped from its mount, one, another. At times, the ship lurching on board up to 32 degrees. Commander of the destroyer, Lieutenant Commander Sergei Shrei Stepanovich Volkov report. Hey, it is necessary to reduce the course. But then in the dark, we will not reach. And in the daylight, entering Sevastopol is forbidden. What to this as it is necessary, so act, I answered. We went at a slow pace. From the northwest, the gusty wind did not stop. The cloud cover was low, and sometimes only a ray of sunshine broke through. These gaps are dangerous, said the commander. And we began to recall when, using them, enemy torpedo bombers and bombers attacked the ships. Remembering and listening to me, Sergei Stepanovich gave an order. Intensify air surveillance. Commissioner Kavashinin, who had just bypassed the battle stations, went to the anti-aircraft gunners. It took about 15-20 minutes. The first, as it later became known to me, reported about the planes, petty officer of the second article, Kulikov. Um, planes on the right nose. Hmm, to battle. I heard Vorkov's order. The commander of the artillery combat unit, senior Lieutenant G.I. Kirichenko, was the watch commander and was on the bridge. Marshes me, Marshes Chapnel. He commanded. Immediately, the characteristic sounds of firing machine guns were heard, followed by large caliber guns. The caps of shrapnel bursts helped me to see the U 87. They were firing direct fire. The aiming was low due to the strong keel roll, but the shrapnel bursts played their role. The planes were knocked off course. The pilots could not withstand the fire and dropped bombs without taking the necessary position in terms of distance and course angle. Shooting stopped, and the headwind still whistled in our ears, salt water mercilessly whipped us. I was convinced that the commander of the ship in a combat situation behaves calmly. Without fuss, his orders are accurate and timely. Confidence in his actions was visibly transmitted to his subordinates. They quickly, 
coherently carried out the commander's orders. Volkov's observation of the behavior of commanders, petty officers and Red Fleet in battle, the ability to notice the strengths and weaknesses of the performers at the debriefing, allowed him to convincingly point out a blunder or slowness, highlight the most distinguished, emphasize their reasonable initiative. As they told me, any such review at meetings and conversations with the personnel helped to eliminate shortcomings, to pass on the experience of the best, to raise the combat training of the ship's crew even higher. I once heard from some of Sergei Stepanovich's co-workers that Volkov was somewhat important in his relations with them, excessively proud. But what I saw with my own eyes, his ability to control the ship in battle, strengthened my opinion of his high fighting qualities, sincerely favoured him. Perhaps I thought he may be allowed to take a little pleasure. A prolonged keel roll caused some of the crew to get seasick. But there was no report from any of the battle stations about the failure of the battle numbers. Consciousness of responsibility gave everyone strength, helped everyone, not excluding young Red Fleet men to withstand the test. Sometimes it rained. With the onset of darkness they announced readiness no. Two, I went into the cabin several times, but I couldn't stay in it. Water was rolling under my feet, and the chair rode from one end of the cabin to the other. The muffled blows, though rare, created a different impression in the cabin than on the bridge. It seemed as if the ship was about to collapse from the concussion. Sleep was out of the question. After midnight, the storm began to subside, but the waves continued to rage. The dials of numerous instruments were glowing on the bridge. Commissioner Kavashinin marveled at the dedication of anti-aircraft gunners. Leering ends helped many. He said, hmm, otherwise it would not have avoided an emergency. Ship navigator senior lieutenant VIE. Ivanov carefully calculated the time of arrival to the estimated point where the mine's weeper was to be located to guide the destroyer along the fairway to Sevastopol, and bitterly reported that we arrived at the appointed place after dawn. When we approached, there was no mine's weeper. From Sevastopol received a radiogram with the instruction to withdraw to Sinop before dark. The commander said with annoyance, We will have to be a lonely object for fascist planes until evening. They will not leave the ship without attention. Our fighters can hardly cover us. What if we go to Sevastopol without a minesweeper escort? I asked. Won't we go off the fairway? We won't fall on mines? We have sailed along this fairway many times. We know it. Well, but still, would we go through on our own? Of course. Our navigator is experienced. But, Sevastopol's radiogram, I asked navigator Ivanos. Can we pass without the minesweeper? Without hesitation, he answered. Absolutely. Haynes Norkov was right. To be all day at sea at a distance not so far from the Crimean airfields of Hitlerites is no less risky than to follow the fairway without a minesweeper. Well, I turned to the commander of the ship. Let's go to Sevastopol. The captain lieutenant looked at me questioningly perplexed. I added, Write in the watch log my decision to go to Sevastopol. By the expression of the faces of all those around me on the bridge, I realized that the decision was to my liking. The commander immediately ordered, Hmm, Petukov on the wheel. Yes, to the helm. Petty officer Petukov, skinny, red-haired and freckled, was known as one of the best helmsmen. Without ceasing to smile, he stood behind the wheel. Sergei Stepanovich reported by radiogram about the departure to Sevastopol. I admired the petty officer. He did not take his eyes off the gyrocompass for a second. Petukov's hands, with extraordinary skill, acted with a manipulator handle, not letting the ship deviate from the course. Looking at the compass and forward along the course of the ship, Vorkov suddenly loudly warned. Do not go to the right. Yes, do not go to the right. We knew that the enemy's batteries would surely fire on our destroyer. There had not been a case in recent times that the ship, entering Sevastopol in the daytime, was not shelled. Everyone waited warily. Early lay on the Inkerman wall as the enemy batteries opened fire. Shell bursts appeared on the bow and stern. Another volley. More, more. My hands clutched tighter and tighter the cold metal rail of the running bridge railing at which I was standing. Anxiety for the men, for the ship, for the safe outcome in these moments especially intensified. After all, now I was personally responsible for the breakthrough of Subrazitelny to Sevastopol. I look intently at the focused Vokov. He is not hot, 
but I understand his condition. The use of artillery zigzag allowing to avoid shooting was excluded because around the minefield. But here I hear the machine telegraph chime. Volkov is transmitting? Hmm. Full speed. And having quickly looked at the course, asks the helmsman. And the Roomba? The petty officer replied. The commander ordered, as I heard in a satisfied voice, a few days later, by order of the commander of the North Caucasus, front on behalf of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USA, the personnel of the leader Tashkent were awarded orders and medals of the Soviet Union. There was not a single surface ship in the Black Sea Fleet, where the entire personnel had combat government awards. Before leaving for Moscow, Evgeny Petrovich Petrov told me about his impressions during the trip to Kamishevaya Bay. He was almost all the time on the bridge and saw how the sailors acted during enemy air raids and torpedo boat attacks. The writer was subdued by the real military valour, the greatness and beauty of the spirit of the Soviet man. Who saw these sailors in battle, he cannot think of each of them without admiration. I have remembered more than once, with what delight you, Ilya Ilyich, told me about the commander and crew of the Tashkent, and I thought that these people, their deeds and feats are worthy of even greater admiration. Evgeny Petrovich told me about one of the episodes that seemed remarkable to him. It was after a long raid of enemy aviation. The firing was over and rolled up sailcloth bunks with cork mattresses were brought to the bridge. As Commissar Konovalov explained to Petrov, these bunks were to cover the bridge to shelter it from shrapnel and thus protect the commander and the bridge crew. Hey, I saw how the messenger brought Yeroshenko's tunic with the order of the red banner. I realized that the commander did not accidentally put it on. However, the commissar explained it, in my opinion, very correctly. The order is the conscience not only of the commander, but of the whole crew. I must admit, continued Evgeny Petrovich, that I was not comfortable by evening. It was different during the day. I saw the attacking planes and maneuvers of the ship, and at dusk the unknown was pressing. On the bridge they were talking about a possible attack by torpedo boats of torpedo bearers, and it had a depressing effect on me. The position of a passenger during the battle is unenviable. Everyone is busy with something, and you are an observer, a spectator. True, they talked about the possible attack of torpedo boats so mundane that I gradually calmed down, but I kept looking to the right, as I understood from the words of the commander that to expect an attack should be on the starboard side. Still, I was stunned when, at the first moment of alarm, the voices of the signalers, who were watching the sea from their battle stations, merged with the salvo and flashes of fire. I came to my senses when the firing stopped and the boats turned away, and the unfinished essay breaking the blockade E. Petrov describes the arrival of the leader in Kamishevaya Bay as follows. And here we saw in the moonlight a piece of rocky land, about which with pride and compassion all our Soviet land thinks now. I knew how small the Sevastopol section of the front was, but my heart squeezed when I saw it from the sea. It seemed so small. It was clearly outlined by the continuous flashes of gun salvos. An arc of fire. You could see it without turning your head. Searchlights were moving continuously across the sea, and the lights of tracer bullets were slowly streaming upward along them. When we moored at the wharf and the loud noise of the cars stopped, an almost continuous cannonade was heard at once. Sevastopol Cannonade of June 1942. Petrov witnessed a conversation between the commander and the commissar when Exo Orlovsky reported that more than a thousand wounded, including women and children, had already been taken aboard. Yeroshenko and Konovalov consulted and decided to take another thousand people. And meanwhile, the sailors were distributing water in kettles. During the day, there was nowhere to shelter from the scorching rays of the June sun. Water was bad. It was delivered at night from the 35th and 73rd batteries in cisterns. This, of course, was not enough, and the wounded were thirsty. Grigory Andreyevich Konovalov told me later how during an air raid, when the large-caliber machine gun on the bridge ran out of ammunition and there was no one to bring them, because the carrier was on watch at that time, Petrov ran downstairs and fed boxes of ribbons to the bridge. In Kamishavaya Bay, he carried seriously wounded men together with the sailors. Now it is not yet possible to write about everything. Petrov finished his conversation with me. Hmm. But I will never forget what I saw. What I heard from wounded Red Army soldiers, commanders, from women and children. How much in these words was the ardent love and gratitude to the sailors. When the time comes, I will definitely write about everything that I saw. 
Unfortunately, when returning to Moscow, E. P. Petrov tragically died. P. Petrov tragically died. He never had time to tell everything that he saw during the breakthrough of the leader Tashkent to the besieged Sevastopol. Years passed. Speaking once with memories of the war on the Black Sea, I told about the crew of the Tashkent. During a break, a short man with a plaque on his chest came up to me and, worrying, began to say that he was one of those taken out of besieged Sevastopol in June of the 42nd year. Not only those who were taken out of Sevastopol, but also our children and grandchildren will never forget the feet of the crew, he said. Our hearts will always be grateful to the sailors. People carry this appreciation through the years, through the whole life. I had an interesting meeting at the Moscow State Institute of Culture in 1962. I was present at a student debate about personal and collective honour. Young men and women listened attentively to the story about the exploits of sailors during the Great Patriotic War, about comradely mutual help, especially about the unprecedented passage of the Tashkent, when courage and heroism were shown not only by individuals but also by the whole collective, the whole crew of the ship. The debate was already over when one of the students, Yuri Serderidi, suddenly asked for the floor. He approached the podium but could not cope with excitement, he repeated several times. Hmm, comrades. The students who were about to leave became quiet. Hmm, comrades. It is difficult for me to speak, but I must say it now. Everything that the Admiral told here about the sailors of the Tashkent is true. My mother and us, three brothers, were taken on the Tashkent from besieged Sevastopol. That was twenty years ago. But today I remembered everything that we experienced while waiting for the arrival of the ship and on the way to Novorossiysk. And I want to say that for our family Tashkent has become a symbol of life and its sailors, the embodiment of heroism. After the dispute Yuri Ivanovich told me about the details of those days, then I received letters from him and his brothers. I would like to briefly tell about this family. In Balaklava, in a small house at the end of 1941, lived with their mother three boys. Stavia, Yura and Sasha, eleven, eight and three years old. The father, Ivan Serderidi, fought near Sevastopol. His part occupied positions on the defensive section, located in the Italian cemetery. During one of the raids, the Serderidi family moved into a neighbouring basement where four other families were hiding. Soon the basement was no longer safe, and the Serderidis, along with others, went to the mountains to a bomb shelter. Everyone who could went to the front line, dug trenches, brought ammunition to the soldiers not once ran to his father and the eldest of the brothers, Stava, whom the fighters nicknamed Pavlik Morozov for his courage and ingenuity, so Stava's second name has remained to this day. In June 1942, the families of fighters on carts came to Sevastopol. June 27, Serderidi, were on the leader Tashkent with the wounded. It was hard for the mother of three children, and then after coming to Novorossiysk, but everything is in the past, although not forgotten father returned from the war, children studied. Now Yuri Ivanovich's parents live in Anapa, where the younger son lives with his family. He is a historian. In Tikharetsk, Yuri Ivanovich heads the district department of culture. Stav Ivanovich, or Pavel Ivanovich, as he is more often called, works at the Novorossiysk flour mill. All brothers have families. Each has a daughter, and Yuri Ivanovich now has two. That's how the life of one family as in a mirror, reflected the life of the whole country. Its grief, troubles, and strengths, and joys. Our people and our country have withstood, and not only withstood, but also became stronger, firmer in life and hardened in the harsh struggle, in order to stand firmly, and not to let repeat what was experienced during the Great Patriotic War. The feat of Tashkent is not forgotten, although the ship itself is long gone. On July 2, 1942, during Hitler's air raid on Novorossiysk, the leader Tashkent received additional strong damage from bombs and sank at the berth. I remembered the story of the commissar of the leader Grigory Andreyevich Konovalov about how the Red Fleet officers and petty officers from BS-5, boiler machinists, turbine operators and bilge operators, were on the deck before the air raid, and part of the crew was on the pier and on the shore. Alarm called them not to shelter, but to their battle stations. They were faithful to their duty, striving to be each at his post, in the inner compartments of the ship to fight for its survivability. The loss of the ship caught them at their battle stations. Part of the leader's crew after his death went to the Marines, and part continued to perform combat service on other ships of the Black Sea Fleet. 
This trip took place in March 1942. When Sue Brazitelny took a course to besiege Sevastopol, I still remember distinctly some episodes of this campaign. The weather forecasters had reported in the evening that the weather was expected to be stormy. The morning the forecast was confirmed. However, having received replenishment and ammunition, the ship left two apps in the first half of the day. With great difficulty, balancing and holding on to the storm lashings, I walked along the starboard side of the upper deck, visited the battle stations. In conversation with the redcoats and petty officers, I notice. It will be difficult today. We are used to it. Everything will be all right. We are lucky. I remembered these confidently said words many times afterwards. The commissar of the ship, senior political officer L.T. Kashnan, proudly told me. In the artillery combat unit, more than half of them are communists and Komsomol members. They set the tone with their endurance, combat training in battle act flawlessly. Everything we have worked out by long training. When we lay on the set course, the wave was oncoming. Assistant commander of the ship, Senior Lieutenant Fiji Bespailov and Bozen, petty officer of the first article, Makar Eremenko, waded along the deck, checking whether everything was securely fastened. From the bridge it was visible how the water covered the half-bank and poured over the commanders who were at the guns. The watch in the second boiler room, by order of the commander, turned off the nozzles and left their post. The bulkheads could not withstand the water pressure. Only two boilers are in operation, which in addition are fed by overboard water. Engineer Captain 3rd Rank Pavel Petrovich Shurin, the main organiser of the fight for the survivability of the ship, and himself sometimes does not understand how it is Tashkent still holds on. But Shurin continues to answer the ship commander's questions confidently. How much water is taken? Will the bulkheads hold? Will withstand. Surin answers. Stop the turbines, no. The ship will turn into a target, and the planes will kill it. But the turbines were still working, and they must work until the last opportunity. Help is coming. Soon will come fighter planes. The commander of BC-5 shortly and calmly gave orders to the emergency parties. Surin's firm voice gave confidence and calmness to his subordinates. At dawn on June 27, at fight to report to Novorossiysky to the chief of staff of the fleet ID. Elise saved that the leader was detected by enemy air reconnaissance. Every 20-25 minutes there were reports to the fleet headquarters. Taft is continuously being attacked by the enemy. I have damage. The aft compartments are flooded. Helm not working. I'm using the machines. Severe damage. The ship is sinking. Need help. According to these radiograms, the reader can judge in what position the Tashkent was. Together with I.D. Elisiv, we listened to the arguments of the Deputy Commander of the Air Force of the Black Sea Fleet, Major General P.P. Keller. And fighters in readiness can fly to Tashkent to cover it, but on the way back they will not have enough fuel, and yet there is a way out. Send to cover dive bombers. The commander of the 40th Regiment, Colonel Kofkin, is waiting for an order. High-speed bombers and dive bombers covered the ships at sea, performed the functions of fighters. Vasily Nikolaevich Eroshenko recalls how the appearance of the P-2 was perceived on the leader. In the sky no longer dozens, but only seven or eight junkers. Hey, I wish I hadn't failed. I turn to the stern, another bomb should fall behind it. And at that moment I hear a sharp shout of the signal. Airplanes right on the nose. I raise binoculars, almost no doubt that this is an attack from a new direction. It's a little early for our hawks to appear. But the rangefinders have already seen it before my... And the planes are ours. The moment more, and I see them too. Ours, only not fighters. These are Petyakov's P-2 dive bombers. They are easily recognized by the vertical sides of the tail feathers. Petlyakov only a couple, and they are not designed for aerial combat but the planes are rushing straight at the junkers, shooting at them from their guns, and seven or eight Nazi bombers, larger and not so swivel, flee away from this impetuous pair, hurrying to drop bombs in a hurry. Something indescribable is happening on our deck. People are screaming, cheering, kissing. And then they start applauding again, raising their hands high above their heads as the Petlyakovs whiz along the side. There are no other airplanes above us, but these two with their native red stars on the wings. What a brave and happy thought had occurred to someone. To send speed bombers ahead of the fighters, which were able to meet us earlier, farther from the shore. 
and this pair was enough to drive away the last Nazi planes. Black Sea Squadron Commander Rear Admiral Vladimirsky reported in the morning Rear Admiral Elisiv. Destroyer Subrazitelny, which arrived in Novorossiysk and Poti on June 27 at Fort Arm, not unloading, interrupting the reception of fuel, went to assist Tashkent. Destroyer Vigilant will leave at 8 Arm. That morning I reported to the commander of the North Caucasian Front Marshal of the Soviet Union SM Budinomu that Tash delivered to Kamishevaya Bay 1,000 soldiers and commanders of the 142nd Rifle Brigade, ammunition for the besieged Sevastopol, received more than 2,000 wounded and residents of the city. Since dawn the enemy aviation has been continuously attacking the leader going backwards. He has damage, but the crew is actively fighting for the survivability of the ship. As soon as Tashkent comes to Novorossiysk, and it will come for sure, I will come right away to hug our wonderful sailors, promised Semyon Mikhailovich. In the same hours I reported the circumstances of the Tashkent passage to the People's Commissar of the Navy Admiral N.G. Kuznetsov. Inform the commander of the leader Eroshenko that he was awarded the rank of captain of the second rank for courage and selfless actions to break the blockade in besieged Sevastopol and the removal of 2,000 wounded. That was the decision of the People's Commissar of the Navy. Squadron Commander Rear Admiral L. A. V. Vladimirsky and Brigade Commissar V.I.D. Semin went out to meet the leader on a torpedo boat to encourage people and organize the work to save them. It is difficult to tell about the joy that seized everyone on the leader when the commander and the commissar of the squadron boarded the ship. Vasily Nikolaevich learned that the rank of captain of the second rank was awarded to him in those hours when the crew of the Tashkent selflessly fought for the life of the ship. Fighters were barreling over the leader. The anti-aircraft gunners were ready to open fire. They had already managed to get ammunition for the machine guns from the destroyer Sobrazitony, which came up and became a lag to the Tashkent, which had stalled the machines. Boats came, motor pumps were delivered. They were immediately put into action. The rescue vessel Jupiter, moored to the Tashkent, also started pumping out water. The sea tug Chernomor was not left idle. A movement of wounded and passengers began. On the destroyer Sobrazitony and on the boats took about 2,000 people. The destroyer noticeably increased the draft. It was overloaded. On the Tashkent remained only those who did not want to get off the ship before coming to Novorossiysk. Grigory Burkal, the political officer of BS2, twice wounded during this campaign, categorically opposed when they wanted to transfer him from the leader to the destroyer. Eugeny Petrov also stayed on the Tashkent. He was offered to transfer to a torpedo boat which could deliver the writer to Novorossiysk faster. I asked permission to stay on the Tashkent until the arrival in Novosisisk. Petrov appealed to the commander of the squadron, who granted his request. The ships that came to the rescue had already stopped taking people from the Tashkent when they found two more babies on the leader. The children were transferred to the destroyer. Torpedo gunners found a place for them at the torpedo apparatus. Someone brought sugar, and the children calmed down. When the Subrazitelny withdrew, the broadcast said that the torpedoes sat someone's children on the ship. Their mothers did not respond. Apparently, they died on the passage during the bombing or shelling. Exceptional naval training and touching care for the wounded women and children were shown by the commanders and redcoats of the Subrazitelny during a very difficult passage. The commissar of the ship senior political officer LT, Kershenin, managed to organize continuous work of the galley. Boilers, everyone was drunk and fed, sailors gave sugar and smokes to the wounded, took out of the lockers clothes for those who needed them. Thanks to the experience of the commander of the destroyer, Lieutenant Commander Captain E.S. Vorkov and excellent military skill of the personnel, about which I will tell more in the next chapter, incredibly overloaded ship safely reached its destination. I got to see the Savrazitelny approach the pier. The ship was loaded above the waterline, people were everywhere. On the upper deck, superstructures, on the aft a bridge, on the torpedo tube platforms, everyone was looking toward the shore. The noise of working fans and machines could not drown out the voices of people reaching the pyre. Many shouted with joy, cried, hugged when they finally saw the shore. When the ship began to approach the pyre, there was an unexpected danger. Passengers and the wounded began to crowd to the starboard side to see the shore and the city. This threatened disaster. Overloaded destroyer could overturn. Decisive actions of the commander, petty officers and Red Fleet men who were on the upper deck, 
prevented the disaster. After sending Sue Brazatelny's squadron, Commander familiarised himself with the condition of the leader and decided to tow Tashkent's stern so safer. It's the commander of the destroyer Vigilant Captain Third, Rank A, Iron Goshenin back small way approached the stern of the Tashkent. Jupiter going lag, continued to pump out water from flooded compartments. The sea tug Chernomor was also on standby. Thus, on the tugboat, accompanied by boats and continuously barreling fighters, the leader Tashkent was safely towed to Novorossiysk on June 27 at 27 at 2015. It is impossible to convey in words the picture of the arrival of Tashkent and Suprazitelny to Novorossiysk. Those who arrived were getting off the ships. Those who could not move were carried out on stretchers. Any kind words of deep gratitude to the sailors for their military valour, courage for their cordial attitude to the passengers were said. From the Suprazitelny torpedo boats carried orphaned babies. Before being sent to the orphanage, they were in the political department of the Novorossiysk naval base. Everyone took care of the kids, especially the girls' red fleet of the communications centre. How can one forget the suffering caused by the war? In those days, the victory over fascism seemed as something infinitely desirable, but far away. But we were all convinced of victory and believed that the time would come when the evil and hateful enemy, who brought our people so much grief, misery and suffering, would be defeated. On June 28, Marshal of the Soviet Union Semyon Mikhailovich Badyoni, commander of the North Caucasus Front, arrived in Novorossiysk from Krasnodar. The personnel of the Tashkent lined up in a large assembly. The commander of the leader captain second rank VVN, Irushenko briefly reported on the results of the campaign. Badyoni thanked Irushenko, Konovalov, Red Fleet and commanders for a successful campaign. Then, as if abandoning the official ceremonial, made a gesture with his hand. Chand a little tighter, and, pointing to the tower, asked Yeroshenko, Can I go this way? Marshal easily climbed the tower, and from this rostrum told about the situation on the southern front, about the difficulties, about the upcoming heavy fighting. Many kind words were said to the sailors. I knew many heroes in the Civil War, saw many heroic deeds, oh, Badioni said. And I am pleased to say today that you Black Sea sailors, the entire crew of the Tashkent have committed mass heroism. You managed to break the blockade and honourably fulfilled the task set before you. All of you deserve combat governmental awards and awarding Tashkent the guard's rank. Thanks to G.V. Ternovsky, it was possible to name the initiators of saving a part of the canvas of the panorama. One of the first to rush to the burning building battalion, Commissar Alexander Kirillovich Karayvin, Commissar of the Courses of Medium Commanders of Coastal Defence of the Fleet. Captain Alexander Petrovich Lohman, the former head of the Courses for Medium Commanders of Coastal Defence, now living in Leningrad, was especially distinguished in saving the pieces of canvas. He became a literary scholar, conducts extensive research and translation work in Leningrad lives, as told Ternovsky and A.I. Kisley. He was the first to notice the fire and reported it to Commissioner Karyavin. Now Kisley is an engineer of one of the Leningrad factories. The representative of the political department of the Black Sea Fleet Senior Political Officer N.S. Kalebnikov took an active part in saving the canvas of the panorama, which I consider my duty to emphasize. He, among others, signed the act about the barbaric destruction of the most valuable cultural monument by Hitlerites. I knew Nikolai Semyonovich as a capable, well-prepared lecturer. His speeches fighters listened with great attention. Speeches and reports Klebnikov hardened the will to victory over the invaders. Political worker Klebnikov is known to me and participation in many operations of the fleet. His Bolshevik word, personal example of courage and resourcefulness, strengthened the military sailors' offensive impulse. Unfortunately, I did not know about all the participants of the Panorama Canvas Rescue. But always when I am in Sevastopol and come to the panorama, I remember the pieces of the canvas delivered by the leader, Tushk, sewn in sailors' blankets. I remember those who saved the main part of the canvas without sparing their lives. The carefully saved pieces of the panorama helped to revive a wonderful work of art, a monument to valour and courage of Russian sailors. June 26th expired. The 27th came. The anchorage of the leader lasted two hours and fifteen minutes. The wind picked up. The moorings were released. Tashkent began to depart. Navigator Eremayev reported to the commander, It's drifting to the left. 
the Tashkent was overloaded and could go only in reverse. It was impossible to maneuver in the bay, and yet Basily Nikolaevich managed to level the leader and get out into clear water. The way back to Novorossiysk was even more difficult. At dawn, a spy plane appeared. Following him, as always, showed bombers. Vestavoy brought Vasily Nikolaevich, new tunic with the Order of the Red Banner. They awarded Iroshenko for participation in the fighting near Odessa. The commissar silently went down to his cabin and in a few minutes came up to the bridge also in a new tunic. Signalmen took turns, substituting for each other, went downstairs and returned to the bridge in the uniform of the first term. At the outer battle stations, many were also in first term. On the town, knew that Russian sailors always, going into a decisive battle, dressed as a parade and honoured this tradition. The enemy planes came to the ship in pairs with a small interval. Iroshenko noticed that this was a new tactical technique of the enemy. On the approach to the leader junkers separated, one attacked on the right, the other on the left, and so on for long hours. The commander of BC-2 Senior Lieutenant S. Novik, saving ammunition, more than once repeated the order given earlier. To shoot only at planes directly attacking the ship. Eroshenko kept his eyes on the flying and diving planes. Maneuvering, he diverted the ship from the strikes of junkers. There was no direct hit, but shrapnel and blast waves caused damage to the leader. On the upper deck appeared dead and wounded. The ship's Dr. Alexei Petrovich Kulikov and military officer Spivak with orderlies were giving first aid to the wounded on the deck. During the firing, the commander of the machine gun, petty officer of the second article Grigory Gutnik, following the traces from the machine gun, found that they did not reach the airplane. He realized, from a large number of shots, the rifling of the barrel had been erased. The battery commander Gimmelman authorized to change the barrel to a spare. The crew replaced the barrel so quickly that the battery commander was extremely surprised when Gutnik reported that the barrel had been replaced. Dmitry Rudakov and Sergei Samsonov from Gutnik's rifle crew were wounded by a bomb fragment. But the incomplete crew continued to fire and, according to the commander of BJ-22, managed to shoot down the bomber diving on the Tashkent. The entire crew, headed by the commander of the machine gun, was awarded the Order of the Red Banner. And one more digression in the story about the events of June 1942. This time I would like to tell more about the fate of the commander of the machine gun, petty officer of the second article, G. F. Gutnik. He came to the Navy by Komsomol recruitment from Donetsk Industrial Institute in 1939. After the training detachment, the commander of anti-aircraft gun was elected as the Komsomol commander of the battery on the leader Tashkent. In July 1942, Gutnik was among those who went to the Marines. He fought near Novosaisk, was a mortar commander, platoon commander in the 16th Marine Battalion. In those days, a leaflet published by the political department of the Black Sea Fleet told about the exploits of petty officer of the second article Grigory Gutnik and the commandant from the leader of the Paris Commune Kobzar. They blew up with grenades a tank that broke through to the position of a mortar, and when the tankers jumped out of the tank, destroyed them. When the 83rd Marine Brigade was formed, the 16th Battalion became part of it. In the battalion, Gutnik was elected Komsorg. As a part of the brigade, Grigory took part in fights at Genchik, northeast of Tuaps, in landing on Miskako, where the battery of the enemy was captured. Hitlerites so hastily escaped that they did not have time to blow up ammunition and guns, but they managed to seize the firing device. Together with Gutnik were commanders Atlasov from Destroyer Vigilant and Smirnov from Leader Tashkent. All three came to the conclusion that the enemy battery with ammunition can be used. They reported their proposal to the command. Instead of firing device decided to ignite the wick. A of artillery powder was inserted into the hole for the striker and ignited. The gun was fired at direct aim. All the ammunition was used during the enemy's attempts to attack the landed paratroopers in order to throw them into the sea. During the landing on the Kerch Peninsula in the area of Eltigen, Grigory Gutnik was wounded. By that time he had already become a lieutenant, part two of the battalion. Thirty years later, the former commissar of the 83rd Brigade, retired Captain First Rank F. V. Monastyrsky, spoke lovingly about Grigory Gutnik, recalled his personal courage, sociable and cheerful character. G. F. Gutnik was awarded the Medal for Bravery, the Order of the Red Star, the Order of the Patriotic War and the Order of the Red Banner. Having recovered from the wound, 
Gutnick was appointed assistant chief of the political department of the OPEC. After the war, Grigory Fedorovich graduated from the Higher Military Pedagogical Institute named after M. I. K. Linen. Today, G. F. Gutnick is a captain of the first rank. He continues to serve in the Navy as a senior teacher at the Franz Higher Naval School. In a letter to me, Grigory Fedorovich writes that he still remembers well his comrades from the leader Tashkent, with whom he fought together in the Marine Corps. Petty officer of the first article Voronin from the Bozuns team, petty officer of the second article Medvedkov, senior redcoats S. Cheshkov, Cook D. Glukov were brave, reliable comrades. Nobody shamed the good name of Tashkent on land. All of them were awarded orders and medals, almost all of them had several wounds. Many of them served in command positions. Gutnik also writes that Sergei Samsonov works as deputy director of the Palace of Culture of Communications in Leningrad, and Leonid Borodkin is a foreman at one of the Leningrad factories. But let's return to the passage of the Tashkent. The enemy aviation continued to strike the leader, which was in full swing. A bomb exploded not far from the port side. The rudder jammed, lost speed, flooded tiller compartment. After emergency party headed by Ivan Kolyajin is working in the tiller compartment, but the rudder continued to remain wedged in the position starboard. The situation was threatening. The water began to flood the compartments where the severely wounded were. Those who could began to climb to the deck. Frequent bomb bursts, continuous firing shook the ship's hull. All this made the wounded, women and children, extremely nervous. At this difficult moment, the commissar of the ship Grigory Andreevich Konovalov was on deck among the wounded. He sent the communist Taranenko to warn those who were in the emergency cabins that they would be helped to get upstairs. And now the loud hoarse voice of the bosun covered the multi-voiced noise on deck. Be patient a little while. We'll soon get everyone out. This voice which had been heard more than once in Kamishivaya Bay when boarding the Tashkent, gave vigour and hope. The men perked up their spirits. Taranenko, with a group of Red Fleet men of the bow emergency team, having fixed the most threatening holes and damages, began to carry the wounded out of the bow cabins, which were quickly filling up with water. The seriously wounded were carried to the upper deck. In one of the cabins, the gangway was torn off. Instead of it, they put a plank of emergency boards and started to pull people out on blankets. Commissar Konovalov, political officer of BS-5, Vasily Smirnov and political officer of BS-2 Grigory Berkal were in the most dangerous places where it was necessary to support people, to encourage, to calm the desperate, to strengthen confidence in the successful completion of the trip. After all, there were moments when at critical moments someone's nerves could not withstand. Among the passengers there was confusion. They grabbed life belts, circles, which were few. Some of them had been thrown the day before to those who had perished from the impeccable commanders, political workers and Red Fleet quickly extinguished these outbreaks of despair, managed to calm people. In such a difficult situation, the crew quickly and accurately carried out all orders in the fight for the survivability of the ship and selflessly fought with the attacking enemy aircraft. And political workers found time to encourage the confused, both wounded and evacuated no longer doubted that the mortal danger will be overcome and the ship will safely come to Novorossisix. And the water kept coming through the holes. The maneuverability of the ship was further reduced. Bombers continued to bomb Tashkent. The barrels of automatic rifles got so hot that they had to be poured with water. Women armed with tarpaulin buckets and soup cans began to give water to anti-aircraft gunners. It had already dawned when the Tashkent passed the place where the impeccable had been destroyed. Nothing on the water reminded of what had happened. Nothing reminds of the days of war and now, when our ships go by sea roads. But Soviet sailors piously honour the memory of their comrades in arms. Passing by the place of destruction of a warship, they lower the Navy flag. Raids on the leader and bombing continued. A bomb that exploded near the starboard side broke through a gap and water rushed into the first boiler room. Petty officer of the second article, Vasily Yudovenko, boiler machinists Fedor Krenyukov, Mikhail Ananyev and Alexander Milov were on watch here. They had literally seconds at their disposal to prevent a catastrophe. They fulfilled their duty to the end. They stopped the combustion in the boiler, vented the steam and closed the valves. The boiler explosion and the ship's destruction were prevented at the cost of lives of Yudovenko, Ananyev and Krenyukov. Alexander Milov, 
burned, managed to reach the gangway. The water that filled the boiler room lifted the unconscious Milov to the hatch, from where he was pulled to the deck and brought to consciousness. The next bomb explosion shook the stern so much that the rudder was back to its original position. The leader regained the ability to manoeuvre. Tashkent took more than 1,000 tonnes of water, and it broke the reserve of buoyancy, but still the ship continued to go to Novorossisk at a slow pace. The crew, courageously and selflessly performing their duties at all combat stations, managed to keep the leader afloat until help arrived from Novorossisk. The commander of BS-5 Surin received alarming reports from the emergency parties at the power station. The cabins were flooded, the central artillery post, where the main caliber fire control devices were concentrated, water was intensively entering the first engine room. Alexander Kutulin, commander of the engine group, and Vasily Smirnov, political officer of BS-5, at the first turbine. The watch is carried by petty officer of the second article Georgie Semin and Konstantin Ivanov. They are the first to feel how Tashkent begins to sink. Already underwater are the valves regulating lubricant supply to the turbine, Turbo pumps, circulation pumps are hidden underwater. The leader left Novorossisk at 13 hours, 55 minutes, with such a calculation that the most dangerous zone of the approach to Sevastopol to pass in the dark. Cutting the calm surface of the Black Sea, the ship was moving at full speed on the course plotted on the map. Navigator Lieutenant A. M. Erevov. It was not very difficult to find Tashkent in the sea. It was going in its usual time and usual course the shortest 180-mile route from Novorossisk. Only by following this route, it was possible during the June night to break through to Kamishivaya Bay, unload everything, take the wounded and have time to leave in the dark. The fighters covered the ships going to Sevastopol as long as the fuel in the tanks allowed them to return to the Caucasian airfields. As soon as our planes turned back, an enemy scout appeared in the air, and after a while bombers showed up. Tashkent had to enter into single combat with enemy aircraft. And in previous campaigns, the leader has not once taken such a battle. The commander and commissar knew that any Red Fleet, petty officer and commander were ready to fulfil their duty to the end. Not infrequently there were cases when people who were wounded or concussed did not leave their posts and tried to accurately and quickly carry out the order, knowing that only accuracy and quick performance of everyone guarantee success. A united, cheerful crew was on the leader, hardy and patient people, almost all of them communists and Komsomol members. With all the hardships and difficulties, even in the most critical moments, no one on the ship was discouraged. And this time the crew of the Tashkent prepared to firmly repel the enemy attack. Junkers attacked the leader from different directions. But the aiming bombing was hindered by skillful manoeuvring and accurate fire of the ship. Installed machine guns and anti-tank guns, Siberians did not remain idle. Despite the interference, bombers relatively accurately dropped their deadly cargo. Many bombs fell where a few seconds ago there was a ship. More than once the manoeuvre of the ship under the control of B.N. Eroshenko saved the ship. N. Roshenko saved the leader from certain death. Bomber attacks were repulsed. None of the dropped bombs hit the ship. About 19 hours, Tashkent approached the traverse of Cape Tador. The signals were looking at the horizon. By time the destroyer Bezuprekni was to appear, which, as they knew on the leader, went approximately the same route as Tashkent. At Mizen 30 pm, a column of black smoke rose high into the sky on the horizon, right on the course, pierced from below by yellow and white vapor. No sound reached the bridge. But everyone realized that something irreparable had happened to the impeccable. The destroyer did not respond to requests from the leader on the radio. Increased speed. We went straight to the clouds of ominous smoke rising from the horizon. Neither the masts nor the destroyer was not visible. Rangefinders reported that they saw low-flying airplanes. We came closer. At the site of the ship's destruction found large stains of fuel oil, the wreckage of lifeboats, emergency ship facilities and near them floating people. It was them, helpless. The fascist pilots shot them from shaving flight. The leader's anti-aircraft gunners drove away the enemy planes with their fire. From the Tashkent dropped life preservers, belts, two emergency rafts. See the people from the impeccable see us. There's a whole group of them waving their arms flying above the water, and they're waving as if they're not calling for help, but saying pass by. Slow speed. Engineers to the barcade. Barcade to launch. Prepare to launch the dinghy. 
these commands come out of my mouth as if by themselves. So writes in his memoirs, the former commander of the leader Tashkent, now retired Rear Admiral Vienna Rashenko. Senior mate I. I. Orlovsky prepared the barge and dinghies for launching. At that time, signalers and air observers noticed two groups of bombers. One group was coming in from the right, the other from the left. To dodge the bombs and successfully maneuver against attacking planes, it is necessary to have full throttle. It is impossible to lower the lifeboats, but all left in readiness. The leader's anti-aircraft gunners opened fire with all the ship's anti-aircraft weapons on both groups of enemy aircraft. Dodging the attacks of dive bombers, Tashkent kept changing course, described the circulation and moved further and further away from the place of the ship's destruction. The bombs intended for the leader fell where people were swimming. From the bridge of the Tashkent they saw their comrades in arms dying from bomb blasts, but they could not help them. The laws of war are harsh. The Charter does not give the commander the right to engage in rescue actions during the battle. On board of the leader there are a thousand soldiers, hundreds of tons of ammunition. To store means to deprive the ship of maneuver, to turn it into a target. At 20 hours and 15 minutes in Novorossiysk, to the Chief of Fleet Staff, Rear Admiral Eli Siev, from the board of the Tashkent was given a radiogram. Continuous air attacks. Course 283. Please render assistance to Bezeprek. The same content of the radiogram went to Sevastopol to the Fleet Commander Vice Admiral Oktay Abreski. The radiogram from Novorossisek to the commander of the leader Tashkent had the following content. To render assistance to Bezoprechny with the onset of darkness, after which to return to Novorossiysk. Proceed to Gram from Sevastopol order. Proceed to your destination. Enemy aviation pursued Tashkent until sunset, seeking to sink it. Anti-aircraft gunners shot down two bombers. With the onset of dusk all attention was focused on the sea, on the serene as it seemed at times, the water surface. In moments of calm the sea looked so peaceful, and it was not in vain that Eroshenko gave the command to intensify observation of the sea. Some time later observers from the top deck battle stations reported the appearance of torpedo boats. They immediately opened fire on them. The commanders knocked the enemy boats off their battle course, and the torpedoes aimed at the Tashkent passed ahead on the ship's course and behind us. I shall never forget how, standing on the left wing of the bridge, I saw two phosphorescent paths rushing against the leader's side in the vicinity of the second boiler room. I clutched the handrails with my hands, waiting for the explosion to be imminent, and only a minute later I realized that the torpedoes had already passed in front of the bow of the ship, which had run into their wake at full speed. Of course I knew perfectly well that the trail of torpedoes on the surface always lags behind them, but in those moments I completely forgot about it. The Italian gunboats were in a bit of a hurry, must have been nervous, not very confident in the ambush, and if the volley was more accurate, we would not have had time to turn away. Leader Tashkent arrived in Kamishavaya Bay at 23 hours and 15 minutes. The enemy, knowing that ships were entering the bay at night, was intensively firing artillery. The pontoon, which served as a berth, was almost completely submerged. Several shells hit it. Tashkent moored. Hiroshenko from the bridge watched the unloading of ammunition and food. Cannons were carried out on their hands. At the same time took the wounded and evacuated residents of Sevastopol. It was necessary to leave the bay in the dark. The thought of the destruction of the impeccable drove the leader's men. Everyone wanted to finish unloading and landing the wounded faster. There was still a hope to pick up the survivors at sea on the way back. The men were walking with children with small knots. The wounded supported each other. Those who could not move were carried from the shore to the ship on stretchers. From time to time there was a hoarse voice of Bozan Sergei Filipovich Taranenko. He was calming the wounded men and women crowded near the gangway. All cabins and cubicles were filled. On the deck and rostrex, in the dinghai sat and lay wounded, and from the board the stream of exhausted people kept moving. Senior mate Orlovsky. Mate froze and Bosun Taranenko made great efforts to fulfill the commander's order and leave access to guns, guns and cranes. In two hours Tashkent took on board more than 2,000 people. Bulky rolls of canvas of the Sevastopol panorama were loaded. I remember how in Novorossiysk they took out from the ship, soon up in sailors' blankets pieces of canvas of the panorama of Ferp, Rubo defense of Sevastopol. Not everything is preserved in my memory from what was told to me at that time by Senior Lieutenant G.V. Turner G.V. Turnovsky, 
the flagship artilleryman of the OVOV, who witnessed and participated in the rescue of the canvas panorama. In the post-war years, I often met Captain First Rank Hero of the Soviet Union G. V. Ternovsky. I knew him from the besieged Odessa, where he proved to be a brave and resourceful commander of the permanent correction post. In the June days of 1942, Ternovsky on the Mofor went to Sevastopol. On June 25, being in the area of the historical boulevard, he saw a fire in the panorama. During the bombing, incendiary bombs were dropped on the panorama, in addition to high-explosive bombs. The day before, high-explosive shells had pierced through one of the walls. The fragments of shells that exploded inside the building ravaged the canvas of the panorama. Tiramovsky, as well as the sailors who were near the panorama, could not be indifferent to the death of an outstanding work of art and rushed to the building. It was not without difficulty that he made his way inside, where it was stuffy and stinking from the fire and thick dust, flying from the backside of the canvas that surrounded the observation deck with a solid cylinder. He saw the sailors undercutting the canvas from above and cutting it to pieces. He immediately joined in the rescue work and together with the others carried the pieces of canvas through the fire to the outside. There was no water to knock down the flames. They knocked it down with their clothes. And when one huge piece of canvas, lying on the ground, caught fire from the edges, ready to burst into flames like a torch, Semyon Anapolsky, an artist of the fleet house, threw himself on the burning canvas, followed by cadets Alexander Kisley and Ivan Pyatopolov, and two more cadets. Rolling on the canvas, they extinguished the scattering flames with their bodies. Everyone who saved the canvas of the panorama was wounded and burned. But people valued every minute, they did not think about themselves. The flames could not be knocked down. The fire was growing. However, most of the canvas was taken out, 